Well, as Nikki was setting up here, we've got the great Bob Branham here today at the Mill House, literally. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we go way back. A lot of people don't know this, but I caught my very first permit with you and my very first tarpon with you 30 some years ago you know i remember that like it was yesterday and i must say i made you you did <laughs> this is all because of you my fish oh, oh, that's hardly true but but if i had a a, a bit of a a start in oh that, i appreciate bob your heart and your passion out on the water there's no one there's no one a close second to you uh -huh. and the passion for the environment too in Biscayne Bay. And I just remember, you know, when I had first seen a tarpon, uh, I think it was, I'm not sure. I think it might've been Raz Reed because Raz's wife played tennis, right, right. won Wimbledon doubles, competed with Chrissy and I was mm -hmm. up with her at Hilton Head. I was tying trout flies in the condo. And somebody said, you get the, need to, get the need to know this guy, Raz Reed. And so Raz and I went bass fishing up there. And I told him I'd just been in Belize. And he said, you got to fish with this Bob Branham guy. Good and old Raz. I He's gave you a call and we, we got hooked up. And then we fished all the President Bush tournaments together and fished against each other in the uh, couple of the tarpon tournaments. Do you and remember that one Bush tournament? I, I think, I'm sure we won. But we were fly fishing, everybody else was bait fishing. And it was raining so hard. Honest to God, you could not see that wall here it is there it is that was there you go how do you possibly catch a fish <laughs> in this weather you remember what happened Show it to the camera like yeah this. yeah look you can't see 20 feet in front of the boat it is raining and, i know you wanted to go in and wanted to go in lightning is striking around i'm saying let's go in let's go and i didn't want to be a wuss you know so i'm thinking to myself okay let's go in now let's go in now <laughs> he's gonna say any minute so 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 what do you do? You hook one. Oh, thank God. Thank God. And it gets off. Damn. <laughs> well, well, what happened was I had this great trophy that I really wanted yeah, yeah. to win for the biggest bonefish. And Dan Root caught an 11-3 the very first day. And it's a two-day tournament. That we was got, on bait, though. With that's, his fish, that's a, that was a fly. That's oh, a, fly a fly division. Okay. He caught 11-3, so we got to go catch this big fish. And the first day we had good weather. Second day it started raining about nine thirty, and it was a torrential downpour. It's the fall fly. No, this, this no, was this a is Bush a President tournament. Bush, oh, tournament. Bush tournament. Yeah. And um, so I told I told uh, I told Bob I said let's just go where the big dog lives. Let's just go. Let's just go look. We we had to look, and it, it was I can't it was begin so, to tell. Oh, you can so, see. You can you see. Can't see. You can see this a square this big right there as Shell, we were going Shell down. Key? No, no, it no. was out in front of uh, Will uh, Harbor. Will Harbor, yeah. yeah. Good, I remember and, that. And it was like 11.30, Bobby goes, there's a puff right in front of you. Go, go to the right, there's a puff. And I just put my fly in there, boom. I hook this fish and it goes out in big fish, big bonefish, when you when they go out, they go left or right. Your normal bonefish will come back halfway and then he goes back out, comes back. But big Is that fish, true, Bob? That's pretty true, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> when I hooked him, I said, this is a big fish, really big fish. He falls off the hook. <laughs> and it lines out at like, I think one or something. And no one is, all the boats have gone in. Oh, way before. Because it's it's, it's dangerous. A, it's a deluge. <laughs> it's a storm. Yes. It's lightning. But yeah. we have Dude. something more important to do. We have got to win the stupid ass little trophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, that was on you because if it was up to me, we'd have been out of there. In fact, I'm sure I said, okay, let's go. So, so what happened? Okay. What did you see? How did well, you, this how did you fish, catch the fish? This fish fell off. There was off. some fish mudding. You know, just, we, we yeah. saw a couple of puffs. A puff, yeah. You could just barely see. Honestly, it was a miracle. It, it all worked out. You I, know? Mean, I mean, seriously. So we, we got the one on. I thought, he falls off. I thought, okay, well, that, that was a miracle. We got to go in now. There's no way lightning's right, right. going to strike twice. Sure enough. I mean, we, we, we didn't go... We didn't move. We were just kind of staying, and waiting. Then, Andy, there's some more. And he flips it over there, and this thing takes off. And this is probably bigger than that. I mean, it was, right. there were big fish in those days on that flat. I mean, right. that was like a, a money spot. And this thing goes, and you know, it's lightning. It's like, oh, you know, <laughs> pulling after this fish. And, and, Keep you to push poles as low as you can to the water. And we and we get. I look over there, and I see it, and I. Ooh, <laughs> money. And I, I always use a net. I I guess it's a bit controversial. Some people say that nets are bad for them. I, I think you can get them in quicker with a net. So I, I'd rather 
land him with the net. He netted this fish. We both started screaming. Yeah, <laughs> it was it crying. Was, it was clearly big enough. It was big, yeah. <laughs> big it was awesome. But we've had a, we've had an unbelievable run over these years. But let's let's go back just a little bit because I know that you're very passionate about conservation. You know, you're up there speaking in Tallahassee, and we just had we're in the middle of a vote count right now. Yeah. What was it like for you, and what is it like for you now going through this whole count last night, looking at the electoral votes? I mean, did you have dirty underwear at all? <laughs> <laughs> are they still dirty? I, How many I, times have you changed your underwear? I scratch my head and I just don't understand how Florida can be in the shape that it's in. Compare it to where, where it was when I was a kid. And, and, and it's the politicians. It's money. It's, you know, it's big agriculture. It's, it's all those things. But, you know, every election you think, okay, this is going to be the time. Okay, we're going to get rid of all that bad stuff and it just it doesn't happen and this time was especially uh disconcerting to me because uh i just had flashbacks from last time right and you know i'm not a big trump fan uh, and everybody that knows me knows that right and he's not a big fan of the environment everybody who knows him knows that and you know anti-science a climate denier so when it looked like we we're going to lose florida and then lose the election i was uh not happy what time did you go to bed last night i went to bed first around two o'clock when it looked like you know i was in despair and i got up about four four thirty and it, it still didn't look any better but they started talking about uh the mail-in votes were, were going to go heavily to Biden and, you know, like Wisconsin and Michigan and and, uh, and Pennsylvania. It looked like maybe he would get a couple of those. Trump was ahead, but it looked like maybe when they counted them all that, that maybe uh, Biden would come through. And Georgia, too. Georgia is still where it was last time I looked. Not really in play, but, you know, not, right. not done yet. Right. So... Knock on wood. It, it, you know, t for me, it's um, you sit back and it's really difficult to see somebody as such lie, blatantly lie, incessantly. Well, you remember, you have been around for a while. If a politician lied like that, he wouldn't even make it through the first round of the the playoffs. You know, the right the. Uh, well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you an interesting story. Well, let's not make it so political, this podcast, but... <laughs> no, no. <'cause laughs> it might turn we'll be done a lot in a second. <laughs> we'll no. be done in a second. You don't have to put yeah, this Yeah, we'll in just there. make it, you know, I'll make this very brief. Um, President Bush, as you know, was a good friend of mine. I traveled with him for 20 years around the world fishing. He wrote the introduction to the book I wrote. I've been to the White House. I was at Camp David when Kuwait was invaded. He was a great friend. I was playing golf with Trump about a little over a year ago, and I'd played with him when Chrissy was still playing the U.S. Open. We used to go play Wingfoot in the morning and go mm. watch her play uh, tennis in the afternoon. I skied with the family in Aspen, so I've known Trump a long time. So I, we were playing golf. We are having lunch before uh, we were going to go play golf, and I asked him because when President Bush... Um, during the burial service and the memorialization of him... When they were at the cathedral in Washington, it was so compelling, not only because of, you know, bearing a president, but you had the Clintons, the yeah. Trumps, uh, and the Obamas in the front pew, and you could have cut the air with a knife. And I went to the one in Houston, but Chrissy went to the one in, in, in Washington. She said it was unbelievable. So at lunch with President Bush, I said, well, what was it like at the cathedral? And you mean lunch with Trump? Lunch with Trump. We're having lunch. We're going to go play golf. And I said, what was it like at the memorial, at the cathedral in Washington for President Bush's memorial? He said, I made him look good by showing up. <laughs> really? <laughs> Can't you throw one to the, for the dead guy? Throw him a bone. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> let's go back to the early years of you and Carl Hyacin fishing together. Oh, but those were great days. Great days. Actually, I think Carl was the one. We had another friend that we palled with, Clyde. Um, those two guys, 
uh, figured out or heard from somebody that there was some baby tarpon at the end of the road on Key Biscayne, right before you get to Bill Baggs Park. There were no houses on that strip of land. And, and this canal came in from the bay and there were baby tar well, babies up to 50 pounds were giants to us. Right. So we'd go snag some mullet and, in the park and drive like mad out there, throw them out, hook up, lose them, get in the car, go back and get some more mullet. <laughs> and, and, and mullet were hard to get. So we were snagging them because they were too far out to cast net. And then later we, we learned you can catch them on shrimp. And so that that's kind of how I started in Biscayne Bay. I had a 12 foot aluminum boat with a six horse and there was a kind of a, a guardrail right there. And then a, a kind of a steep uh, hill Drop off. down to a beach. So we'd un unload the boat, car top, take the boat off the car, take the tr motor out of the trunk, six horse, hook it up and go out to the flats. We'd, we'd go to Stiltsville because that was just out around the corner. Not and too and so this away. is when you were like 16 when you could first drive or? Yeah, when we first started going. As our first trips for bonefish were to Isla Mirada, but when we figured out that they were here, we could go after school. Right. So we, we did that some. And <laughs> we parked the car over in the side, you know, we'd drive into the neighborhood and park this at, the, at a Vega lot. And it was cool. And, you know, we'd have like two dozen shrimp. And, you know, we, this was, you know, bare bones. What, what year is this? This is probably 1969. Because in 70, he went off to school. And, you know, I got better at it because I did it more. Right. But still, it was my, my little boat. It was crazy. You couldn't run from the marina. It was too far with the six horse to take it, you know, right. half a day to get there. So that's how we started. And, and you know, we, no polling platform. I had a little 12-foot aluminum boat. It wasn't a John boat. It was a pointy bow. And, you know, we'd putt-putt out there. And we'd fish. We'd see some bonefish. We'd catch jacks and you know when we got down to the bottom of our shrimp you know you, after two you have two dozen shrimp you know about 10 of them would die and by the end of the day they were these pink stinky things <laughs> so we just cast out cast a rod out lay down and just wait and most of the bonefish that we caught were doing that just drifting hang, not we were stopped or you were staked yeah. out yeah kind of staked out i think we had a, a wooden closet dowel that we used to pull with that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, it was like, uh, yeah, Guggins. So, did, so did you have any intel, or did you did you have like a mentor that you found these spots from, in, or did you just used to go out there? In those and... days, we just we just went out there. We had a friend whose father was a guide in in uh, Locks Hatchie for bass, and he knew about bonefish a little bit. He never went, but he kind of there's bonefish out there. So we get out there, and there's flats out there. Holy cow. And we'd see this yellow uh, Hughes bonefisher go by. Yeah, it was Curtis. But he didn't, you know, we couldn't follow him anywhere because, you know. You had a six horsepower. Yeah. He was he was gone. Wait, we'd see him on the Cape Flat. It was because we fished around Cape Flat mostly. So Carl, when he got back from school, got a job at the Herald doing a magazine section. And he did a story on Bill. And by that time, I had a, a beat up old, old used, used bone fisher. And, uh, you know, by that time, I, I was seeing Bill on the flats a lot. And <laughs> we thought we were the coolest kids in school if he, if we were on a flat and he came and cut in front of us and fished it. And then you knew you were we, on a good we spot. We were in the right spot. Oh my God. <laughs> Cutting off or, or not, it was care. fine. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, we we didn't even know it was bad. Right. <laughs> we were still catching fish back then. Honestly, uh, the fishing was good, uh, beyond good, but it was Bahamas good. So, so he did the story on Bill, and and I got to be friends with him. He introduced me to him, and and one day I don't know after a couple of years, Bill said, "Hey, you want to take a charter?" <laughs> I was one for Publix, and and yeah, yeah, I'll take a charter. What I got to do? Well, you just you know, show up at the dock, bring some rods, you know, 
you can follow me if you want. We're going to go out by Soldier Key and, you know, mess around and fish. And you take the ladies. <laughs> so I had the wives. And What was that like? Some of my best stories are from that trip. <laughs> I heard one, you, you speaking about relieving herself or something. She had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> that was that. She, she didn't tell me she had to go to the bathroom, but she... She hooks his bonefish and, oh, my God, oh, my God, I, I made it in my pants. I didn't know what that meant. I made it in my pants. It's a northern saying for right. I peed my pants. And I'm going, what? You did what? I made it in my pants. What, do I, what could I do? Sure enough, you know, she got excited and made in her pants. <laughs> and so... Before we hooked that fish, that was late in the day. But earlier in that day, we met those guys, Bill, for lunch. He had the two hotshot husbands. And we're sitting there and, and tied up for lunch. Oh, Bill, was he's a smart old codger. He blocked me. He cock blocked me. So those guy, two guys were fishing, you know, just hanging the rods off, chumming like we used to do. And and my ladies couldn't, couldn't cast because they were the other boat was in the way. I was okay. We were eating lunch. Right. They get a double header. It's like, so my ladies go, how come we can't fish? <laughs> well, we, yeah, we can't. So the one lady goes, I could have been at Loman's Plaza. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Were, were you all in? When were you all in as a guide? I mean, because your first outing was with these two women. Well, you know, what, I, I. What was that learning curve like? If I had fished Biscayne Bay a lot, a, a lot by myself, so, and the fishing was really good, um, so finding the fish wasn't as big a problem back then as it is now. In fact, I got a hand, my hats off to the the new guides coming up now. Back when I started, there were fish. You just had to go if you had you a pair of eyes, and you weren't just completely, uh, you know, crazy about you know, in the wrong spot because they weren't everywhere, but, right. you know, you had spots. Now, the guys that are good now are really good where, you know, I, you know, are they people teaching thought you? I was good. Are they teaching you, these new guys? <laughs> no. <laughs> are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> they throw rocks at me when I go down there. But I'm saying, what are you learning from the new guys, if anything? Um, Really, we don't have any new guys per se in, in Biscayne Bay like right. that. I'm talking about the the guys in, in Isla Mirada. Okay, and I don't go down there like I used to. But you know, people like Jared and and Richard Black and and, and those guys are they're really really good. Right. What makes them that much better? Uh, Just that fishy instinct. You know, there were always good guides and and okay guides and bad guides. Right. Uh, it, I mean, that's. That's always going to be It's the like same. life, you yeah. know. So those guys just, they have, they're fishy. You know, like you say, they're they're fishy. You know, I really find amazing, and I don't know, maybe you can relate to this, but speaking with with Kroka and Jared Raskob recently, they were talking about how they pattern these fish and how they know in 10 minutes... This fish is going to come up and tail two of them, and they're going to well, be that, way. That, that's shocking to me because it you could easily do that back in the day. You could easily know that that you know when the tide starts falling, you know fish are going to show. One south of Soldier is going to have eight or ten schools go rolling by, and then so then you can go to three south of Soldier, and and eight or ten more schools will go rolling by, mud you know mudding as they yeah. Well, they don't do that anymore, and and. Uh, so you cannot pattern. You have to have, well, you know. Perseverance. Say there's 10 spots that might have fish in the bay. There used to be, you know, 50. But now say there's 10, and that's probably being generous. There's probably really only five spots in the bay that, that have fish consistently. Are you serious? You, you, you might have, yeah, no, true. You might have fish anywhere at any given time, but but consistently there may be five spots. One of those spots is going to have sharks on it. So if you hook up, you're going to get sharked. So I save that one until I can't find anything anywhere else. Because you'd rather not fish there. Yeah, and, and the fish. fish are big, and, and they're in, it's a spawning aggregation. And when they're there, uh, there are 
so many sharks. It's crazy. You don't even see them sometimes until you hook up and then. Wow. So you can't pattern. You got to just go to all those spots. Just fish hard. You got to fish hard. I mean, at least that's the way it is in the bay. I, I, I'm glad those guys in the Keys can pattern because that's the only way you can be consistent. And if you're not consistent, you're not really that good a guy. Yeah. When, when's the last time you caught a double digit bonefish in the bay? Uh, I caught one with Pat Ford probably maybe a year ago. It was about a, I don't know, it must have been about a 12 pounder. I mean, it was a wow. good one. It was on one of those spots where uh, there's a spawning aggregation, but they weren't there that day. We were actually chasing a school of baby permit, you know, 10, 12 pounders. It was a big school and there was a, a big uh, boat trail, deep place where the, you know, big yacht got stuck and it dug out the flat and the permit like to get in there. So, you know, okay, Pat, you see that he's got a crab on there and he's got his girlfriend and he was going to hook up, give the rod to his girlfriend and, and take pictures. She's very photogenic. So he does that. He makes a cast. He hooks up. He gives it to her. This fish goes 150 yards. I said, Pat, that's not a permit. I saw him. There was like 20 of them. I said, it's, those little permit can't do that. Pretty sure that's not a permit. So we're fighting and fighting. And uh, she gets tired. He takes over the rod just as this big, gigantic weight comes after his fish. So I start pulling. I know I'm not going to catch him. So I start the motor and we start after him. We buzz around. We got the fish. And, you know, luckily Pat took over because, you know, he was really quick with right. the rod. And we got him in, put him in the net and, you know, put him up to the other end of the flat. Away but, from the shark. Yeah, so we thought. By the time we got there, the sharks were still, they're after us, following us. Wow. So I, we let the fish go in deeper water. I think he got away. You right. know, it looked like the sharks kind of let him alone. But, I mean, there's still days when I have as good a day as I ever had in the bay. Is that right? You know, where I'll catch eight or ten fish. What is your methodology as a guide on a day of fishing? <laughs> Do you have something as such? Because Mark, Mark Croca told me something about you, and I want to hear your <laughs> well, point of view first. I hope he was kind. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, what I like to do is build on what I did yesterday. So, or, you know, the day before. And the, I know the tides are going to be, you know, an hour later. And I, since I've been doing it a long time, 40 plus years, I almost don't even have to look at the tide tables. I just know what moon phase it is. Okay, the you know if it's full moon, the tide, high tide's right. going to be about nine o'clock, and you know so sort of you you probably know that. I mean, Instincts. you just know it, yeah. you feel you almost you can feel it. Right, it's muscle memory or something, or or instinct or or whatever. But but you have that, so that's what I'll do. Um, or if I had a really good. Uh, Caster. bunch of fish no, how about do, does your client ever matter in where you go and how you fish <laughs> it should matter more but you know me i'm just going to go find the fish and i think as a guide that i can get you a fish if i find a fish i i to can me, catch it a, a good guide is a guy that can take some guy that's hardly ever goes and he can get that guy to catch a fish right where like those guys that win the tournaments all the time, you know, like Andy Mill and those guys, no. they don't need a very good guy. <laughs> they need somebody to find know, get them there. You know, so I always thought that uh, the true mark of a good guide is to be able to have a good day with a average or below average customer. And, you know, you always have to think in the back of your mind if the guy's a lefty or a righty. And But honestly, I... I you just want to find fish now. Yeah. So even back then, I, you know, I, you got to go backhand. You got to go backhand or, you know, well, you know, we fish before. Sure. You can actually do that. Some of the guys can't. Right. If you don't have a backhand cast in the keys, you know, you're losing 50% yeah, of your shots. Half the day, you're out of the game. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, but I, you know, I, I remember talking about a backhand cast when Nikki was smaller. I don't know, maybe 15 or so. 
I had a tarpon coming at two o'clock. I said, here he comes at two. And Nikki goes, spin the boat. I said, no, it's a backhand cast. I want you to make this backhand cast. It didn't matter about the wind or anything like that. I just wanted him to get used to throwing yeah. off the backside. He said, dad, will you please spin the damn boat? And he kept going. <laughs> So I finally pushed the push pull and, you know, got the bottom and, and pushed it as hard as I could and threw him right off the bow. <laughs> Spun me right off the goddamn bow. <laughs> now, yeah. he's, now he's underwater. That's he, harsh. He, he gets back in. We're having lunch. And it couldn't have been an hour later. We had lunch. I lit a brand new cigar. I go to take my first step to climb back up to start pulling. I slipped and went head first underwater. <laughs> Ru- Car- ruined your phone. Ka- karma came really back karma instantly. Had. Really? Let me remind me not to piss you off. So I don't want that to come back on me. <laughs> but yeah, you're so right because a lot of people don't realize that you've got to have great dexterity in casting. Yeah, to, I mean in this fishing. kind of fishing, this is this is the bigs, you know. This yeah. isn't the dabbling, you know, a nymph in a trout stream. This isn't, you know, with the strike indicator. Right. This is this is like it's the major, major leagues. Yeah, it's hunting. And and you're standing on the bow. You're waiting all day for five, ten shots. Yeah, that's that's a good day these days. It's Isn't a good it? day. <laughs> it's funny. Some of the other guides that I pal with, we'll see a you know a new guy at the dock, and he'll come up and say, "Man, it was so good out there yesterday." And I know it's been crappy. Yeah, it was so good. We had seven shots. Seven honest to god shots. I'm thinking, dude. <laughs> you have no idea. Good. <laughs> Uh, you know what? I've, what I was always impressed with too, fishing with you, and um, and the more I started doing this, I realized the really good guides can go from Miami to the Marquesas and fish well. And and you adapt, you were going down and winning the tournaments in Isla Mirada. I think you won two of the Spring Flies with Raz. You're always competitive. You fished the tarpon tournaments. I remember the first time. I had seen a big group of large fish. We were out on Nine Mile Bank, and you you said, "See that wake out there?" And it looked like a friggin' tsunami. I'm like, yeah, what is that? He said, "That's tarpon, tarpon." I started shaking. I was like, this. You know what? If it doesn't if it doesn't make you pucker, it's not worth doing. Oh, oh my god! I could barely stand myself. I couldn't sleep at night, knowing I was going to go tarpon fishing the next day. And I'd look out at midnight, and the palm trees were calm and still. I'd just get in my car and go to the keys. I remember one spring tournament, I wasn't fishing in it before I started fishing tournaments. I was fishing with um, Harry Spear and I was at the boat ramp. I was at the dock at the Lorelei, right? It's like 545 <laughs> or 430 and people are just getting ready to go and have breakfast, getting ready to go out for the day of tournament fishing. And Kevin Garren was there and he looks at his watch and he knew I wasn't in the tournament. He says, what are you doing here? I said, <laughs> I'm getting ready to go fishing. <laughs> he said, what time are you going? I said, I think he told me 7.30. It was like 4.45 in the morning. But this world that we've been in for so long has, has meant everything to us. Yeah. It's funny. I have a similar story. When, when Carl and I were kids, uh, we'd go to the Keys once or twice a year for a couple of days. And spring break was one of the times we went. And we went, it wasn't spring break, but it was, it must have been, sometime in June after school. And and we hired Billy Knowles, the only time I ever fished with a guide. And we hired him for a half a day to go tarpon fishing. Because we uh, neither of us had caught a big tarpon before. And we didn't have any big fly tackle or anything. So so we we used to stay on top of Bud Mary's. They had a like a two room uh, efficiency up there. And, you know, we were right in the middle of the action. It was so cool. So Carl calls Billy and, and Billy says, okay, what do you all want to do? I said, well, you know, we're going to tarpon fish, fly fish. Yeah. Can you fly fish? Yeah. 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 We can do. Okay. So why don't you meet me at the dock around nine o'clock? So I said, no, 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 Billy, we're here. We're staying up in front of B- Bun Mary's. We can be here at four o'clock, five. What time do you want us? He goes, son, why don't you meet me at the dock at nine o'clock? <laughs> <laughs> it was his last day. He they used to pack up earlier, way back then. This was like late late sixties, and he was going up to his farm. It, this was going to be his last day, and so we we pull we go we go to Buchanan. We're the seventh boat in line. Oh my god! <laughs> and the water is like chocolate milk. I'd never been there before. I don't know. And he goes, he goes. Well, the fish are going to come 
right down this bank. You see that that flat? Yeah, you can barely see the flat. That's how muddy it was. Big school of mullet in there. And I don't think I've ever seen it like that since then, except when the algae bloom was around. So he said, they're going to come like that between us and that boat there, and they're going to come, and they're going to go right by us. Okay. So we're, we're sitting there, and, and the guy up front whistles. The boat says, get ready, there's some coming. They're letting you know they're on the way. Yeah, then back then, yeah. you know, they'd either wave or say, here they come. We're sitting there, not, don't see anything. Billy didn't see anything either. So he, he goes, man, this water's dirty. He goes, you know what, why don't you just... Why don't I just cast? And it was a really hard right-handed, you know, win. over your right shoulder win. And I'm, you know, I'm like, Billy, can, can I go on the back of the boat? Why would you want to go on the back of the boat? I'll just cast left-handed and I won't get hit with the fly. And he goes, what? You can cast left-handed? I said, yeah. Can't everybody? He goes, <laughs> right. no, this is how we do it. And he showed me you know, the backhand cast. I said, well, I'd rather just sit back there and go left-handed. He goes, let me see you cast left-handed. Because he'd see me cast right-handed. I mean, that, that wasn't great, but I could. Right. So I, he goes, oh, my God, let me try that. So he tried. He, you know, he was better at the backhand. He was really good. He's a good caster. So we're, we're sitting there, and, and I just blind cast. I had three fish eat my fly. Blind casting. Blind casting. Blind casting. And one of them, I hooked up right next to the boat. <laughs> Like, holy shit. And the, the line got wrapped around something on the on the boat. Because back there, you know, in the back right, of the boat, all, was kinds all that of stuff. Yeah, you know, it's not the best place to fly fish. But And I was just fumble fingered anyway. That was the best day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's an eye opener. You it know, so when you cool. first see those animals and first get attached. Yeah. Uh, Croker told me, he said, you could wring the potential out of a flat better than anybody. In that your patience, you knew the timing, and you waited for the fish like a like a predator. It was nice you know, of him to say. It. It, it, he probably just saw me on a good day. <laughs> no, they all know you better. Well, you know, you know. Okay, say you would probably do the same thing. I think you talked about patterns before. So if if I was on a flat yesterday or the day before, and it was pretty good, and I pulled up there and there were fish there. I'm, you know, I'm, I've got that flat on my radar for the next day. So the next day I'll show up there, but I want to be there a little bit earlier. And since they were there when I got there, I might even want to be a little bit earlier right. still. So that's what I would do. I, I'd pull up there and, I, and if they didn't, if they weren't there right away, I felt like, you know, I had them in my back pocket and they were going to come. So that's why he might have thought that because I, you know, I had a little intel from yesterday. And, and, that's to me that's guiding you know that's right. because having great intuition they're not that, everywhere they right. they never were when there were shitloads of them they were not on every flat right and there's things that make them go to other flats you know boat traffic or or uh you know a boat gets stuck someplace or you know water skiing or you know there's all kinds of things that move them around Maybe the the shrimp moved because of the wind. So you still got to go where you thought they were yesterday, and if they if they don't show there, then you know think, huh, oh, hmm, you know the wind was west yesterday. Now it's east. It's probably pushed the bait someplace else. Let's go try this other flat. And and you know when it, there's no uh, substitute for being out there right. a lot. And you just you don't even really think about it. You say, oh God, I know where to go now, and, and you go. You know, you're not always right. Full disclosure. That's <laughs> what what makes bonefish so great? Why do you love bonefish? And is that your favorite fish more so than the tarpon? To me, yeah. I mean, if it was just you and me going fishing, I'd want to go tarpon fishing. But but on a day in day out basis with customers. Um, I'd, I'd rather go bonefish. To me, they're a little bit more honest. Like if you get the fly in front of them. That's what Steve Huff said. Yeah. They're honest. Yeah. Unlike permit. Right. Although I, I have pretty good luck with permits. So so I, I don't, I mean, I have lousy luck with tarpon. I have better luck with permit than tarpon. And how's the permit fishery in Biscayne Bay? I mean, I, I think it's, it's held up somewhat, but uh, it's so far below what it was that it's sad. 
You know, I've always found having fished with other guides, they use other patterns for permit, but you have a pretty similar pattern for both bonefish and permit, which yeah, is the epoxy I head. use epoxy flies and, and a little bit different one for bonefish and permit, but you know, the bonefish one I catch permit on and the permit one I catch bonefish on. So Right. So but that's kind of like an old Nat Raglan fly. I mean, he did I'm the not mold. sure. It's I'm not sure who, you know, Started maybe epoxy it, the head. Like it that. could have been Harry. I, I, thought know, it, Harry. I thought it was Steve. Could have well, been Steve. Well, I, well, I don't really well, know. Well, Steve and and uh, and Dell, they didn't know that the epoxy created weight and and created that fly to sink. Remember that? Right. Well, and that came from Nat Raglan. Nat Raglan told him that and fly needs to, weight. He used to epoxy the daisies as eyes on the fly. Right. And well, then what they happens? Start putting weight in it. You have to weight it because the, the epoxy itself is kind of neutral buoyant. It's it's not going to make the fly sink, but when you pull that flat head, it comes to the top. So that'll give you that motion you need. It that ba- turns that bouncing. out that that it up and down it. is what they like. So you have to make it heavy enough to go back down. So you strip it and it goes back down. You strip it, permit like that. Seems seemingly. I mean, I. <laughs> I used to think I was an authority, but you know they look. Look, you do what you do well. Yeah, I mean, I, I people still, do to things this other, day, other ways, and they do have great luck. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can use any fly that I want for bonefish or permit. But and that you know, fly, I, I like fly. my two flies. To first off, you know they're my go-to, and I have some crab flies in the box too. It, nothing, they're not eating that. I'll I'll switch off, but right. usually I'll say. <laughs> Like if you came on the boat and you had one of your your super deluxe crab flies and you threw out a permit and he didn't eat it, I'd say take that piece of shit off of there, put this one on. And then if they don't eat my fly, I'd say Andy, you're not casting it very well, <laughs> <laughs> or work it a little bit. You got to work it like this. Oh, I remember you trying to teach me how to work it. I I I don't know. You know, you just do something so different with it's, the, the it's, way you work it. It's the hop. It really they like that hop. Here, I got a handful of dye. Pick. Pick a pick a dice. Pick pick one die and tell me what number it is. I have to tell you. Yep. What three. Is what is it? Three. Three. Does that remind you of your first sexual relationship? <laughs> no. Yes. No. Okay. Put it back in. Grab another one. What's that number? One. Does that remind you of your first sexual relationship? No. Put them back in. <laughs> no, okay. Grab them all. Okay. Shake them up really hard. Does that remind you of your first sexual relationship? <laughs> so <laughs> so we, were, we were talking to Alf Luger yesterday about feeding fish because he's he's the best at he everything. Was a master, yeah. But we were talking about feeding fish, and he was talking about it's all how you wiggle your worm. You know how to how to make that fly speak on your behalf. Absolutely, hundred percent. You can make a crappy fly get eaten. You can make a good fly get ignored. So it's not the and, arrow; it's the Indian. Yeah, and he was speaking about how everybody's always so quick, you know, slow, just slow everything down. Yeah, except I like to, <laughs> I like to move it. Past. But also too, you you're. Yeah, but it's different. Each fly is different, you know. But also too, you're fishing permit in current a lot of times. On edges where there's a, a chance. A lot of times. Not always, but yeah, that's my... In, in the bay, that's where we find most of them. Right. But it works equally. In Key West, I use the same fly. Working it the same way. On the flats where they're tailing. But it's got... There has to be some current where they're tailing because that fly that I use rides with the hook down. And if they're really tailing, it, it, it's going to be shallow. They're going to... It's going to get stuck, stuck in the weeds. I don't right. like to use weed guards. So in that instance, I'd probably go to a crab fly if they were really tailing good. On a on a quiet flat, right? Do you go down to Key West? Used to go down more? all the time. I don't go down at all because that's when the ter- permit fishing was really good. Back when Steve and Dell, yeah, it were, was were seeing... it was really good. It was really good in the bay too. But it was down there. There were no bonefish, so you'd have to worry about whatever you saw was permit, and you'd see as many permit down there on a good day as you would see bone fishing in Ala Mirada on a good day. Wow, it, it was incredible, it, it, seriously incredible. Is it hard for you to go to work now? I mean, look where you will live. It, will this cut into my business? Yes. You know, it is I mean, look, you drive. Hard. You drive down ninety five. You see a bunch of chaos on a daily basis, <laughs> and your reprieve is out there in Biscayne Bay when you get there. But now it's so difficult. It's like 
it's like you, you're all jacked up. You wanted people to see what you know and what you see. What I used to see, yes. yes. It, it's, it's way harder. I'm older. It's harder work. My back hurts. The fishing's nowhere near as good. I mean, nowhere near. It's still, you know, it worth doing. Good. It's right. worth doing. Is this the new norm? Is this the new world? And we just have to acclimate to I'm this? A, I'm afraid it is a new world. And, I, and, you know, there's more people fishing, even though, I, mean, I don't know how it is in, in Isla Mirada now, but, you know, before the virus and before the the downturn in bone fishing, there was a lot of people fishing the flats for right. bonefish down there. Right. So, like in Whale Harbor, you might pull up in Whale Harbor and there was nobody there, so you, you fish. Well, you don't know, but one guy already went there right. before you, and then another guy went there before that guy. The same place went. Sure. You know, so you might not know that, but it didn't matter. Um, there were so there were so many. They there was a lot of bonefish, and yes, they get antsier you know if they've been fished but if you do it if you you know if you're good at it you find you them. can catch them even even the ones that are pressured you can catch yeah like i used to always hate going way back in the back country because those fish are damn spooky like on the west side of biscayne no i'm just i was talking in alam rada more by crab key in that, in that yeah. area down there when there used to be a lot of fish there i went there one tar one uh fall fly pulled up there we got like 45 minutes before you lines in. So we just sat there and the fish, I'm, literally, you Damn. can't, you can look 180 degrees and there's fish everywhere. They're just happy. And we're like, this is going to be great. I hear a boat start up. I, I could see it a mile away, at least a mile away, not even near our bank. Starts up, fish. And they start the tails pushing. get stiff. And they, st and they start pushing. And they all st pushed right by us and left. Now, it could have been it was getting that time of the day. It always felt to me like they they heard that motor. Well, I fish, you know, by Calusa Cove. That's one of my favorite. Old, they're not there now. But there's a little, little, you know, blind channel that cuts through that flat. And... That's the fish love that spot. It's a little bit deeper. They're mudding in there really good, and and boat will go right by, over the top of them. I didn't care. I just wait a few minutes and come back and start mudding again. Oh, how cool! So those, I'd rather fish for for fish that are used to boat traffic, honestly, right. because they're chance. not as spooky. Right. You, you know. You know what's fascinating about you, Bob, is is, you know, in the winter months when it's cold and it's kind of crappy out the the everglades flamingo can be great red fishing snook fishing drum fishing even tarpon fishing in white water and stuff but you're a bonefish guide yeah pretty much you don't fish over there do you used to go once in a while but it, it's it's too far for me to drive and drive home fish all day and drive home i mean i did it when i was younger but that's so far. i kind of trained and I don't like to redfish. Well, that's what I was going to say. I remember seeing you at the boat show a couple of years ago, and you were talking about how poor the bay was and how bad the bone fishing was. And you said, I don't want to be a goddamn redfish guide. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that on TV? Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. That's exactly how I feel. I, I, you know, and I, I like snook. I like tarpon. But, you know, the mainstay over there is redfish. And it's just, to me, just not the same. It's a... It's okay if you're there, you know, if you end up there and you're camping or whatever. And you, but to, to go there on a charter to me is, is With the big drive back and forth. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's just, and if, I know a lot of guys, that's where all their business is and, right. and they're really good at it. And they catch these grand slams. What, what, what's that Everglades grand slam? A trout? A redfish <laughs> and a snook. <laughs> a <Whoopee>. jack. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Whoopee. <laughs> yeah. uh, talk about um, Bill Curtis. You know, part of our podcast is are, are the characters and the stories. And Bill Curtis was like the commissioner of Biscayne Bay. He was certainly a, a, a mentor to me, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Talk, he, talk to us about him a little bit. He, he, you know, called me and asked me if I wanted to take, you know, my first charters. And, you know, I didn't have any charters except the ones that I got from him. He was very gracious you know he'd call me on the radio and say there's some fish moving over here of course you know i'd call him on the radio too and say i found some fish 
and that happened once in a while, you know, even back oh, then. Cool. I'd find him before he did. But he was a curmudgeon old guy. He yelled though. at everybody, didn't he? he? If you're he he was a really good friend of mine for a long time. And then when I got established, he was you know, on the downslope and I was on the upslope. And, you know, he was a bit grumpy and and some guys did not want to fish. A lot of the customers that I got originally from him fished with me because I was nicer than he was. Right. That there are people that will argue that fact, but nicer, not many. Than, uh, nicer than him for sure. For sure. Not nice, but nicer than Bill. Right? <laughs> so so he came to the boat ramp one day. He wasn't working and I had a two boater and he got so pissed at me. So he didn't say anything. I could tell he was pissed. He just stormed off. You know, he didn't have his boat. He was just checking things out. And he called me that night and he goes, what the hell are you doing? I said, what do you mean? He goes, I give you all these charters. You know, I, you know, I teach you all the stuff that in the bay. I let you, let you hang around with me, you know, buy you the books, send you to school. And you don't call me on a charter. And I said, and I know what to say. I didn't want to slap him down, but I was a little angry the way, you know, he was kind of treating me. Right. And I said, Bill, they did not want to go with you. <laughs> they told me not to get you. He goes, oh, okay. And <laughs> he understood. Right. And it was okay with it. But there were times when he'd run me over just like he ran everybody else over and, you know, cut in front of me like he cut in front of everybody. He told, we did the interview with him, you know, um, a long time ago for for that tarpon book I wrote. And he was he was speaking about, he used to see like 100,000 tarpon a day from Miami going down through Ocean Reef. Is that true? Is that number outlandish? I mean, what do you remember, you know, numbers wise from the early years? Well, literally you could, when there was nobody fishing for them, they don't get busted up. There's people not running over them and stuff. You can have, literally have a school of fish that would take, five minutes to go by wow and and it wasn't like well just one long string it was like 30 fish wide 20 fish deep it's a highway of fish for five minutes wow i have a picture of carl and me in, in uh off a of grassy key on a big white area and he's casting at this giant wad of fish and you know i pull pull he cast cast pull pull cast cast and literally we're just enveloped and they're so happy we could not get a bite you but know, you were in we them. didn't know what to do you were in we them. didn't know how to do it but yeah and those big wads like that would would were commonplace now i, I think that he was probably talking about a really good day because there'd be days when none went by right sure you know but there were just that many more yeah you know and the thing is the question is do you think that we have lost 90 percent of that population or do you just think that they're swimming in deeper water which a lot of people speculate yeah i think tarpon are in better shape than than the bonefish for sure but uh i don't think there's nearly as many as there used to be right the bonefish you know in the spring uh, it started in the fall when they were on the, their migratory you know, trips to the spawning grounds. You could sometimes sit on a point and have 20 schools go by. It was almost like tarpon schools going by, but you could see a, a big push coming. Racing 20 miles yeah. an hour. And, yeah. and then back of that, you might see another push. And, and there might be 50 fish, maybe 10 fish, sometimes a thousand fish. And 20 schools would go by you in the course of, a, you know, a tide. And they're going offshore to spawn. No, they're going down the beach. Oh, they're going down the beach. And then they get to where they gather. I, I've learned this since, and I think it's pretty reliable info. They go, they get into a spot, they mill around, and, and when the time is right, they jet offshore, way offshore, do their thing, come back, and Start all <laughs> migrate over. home. Do you think BTT is doing a good job with I think the science? Doing, I think they're doing a, a wonderful job. And, I, and you know, can't compare it to anything because there's nobody else doing anything. Right. They just recently had uh, some fish spawn in captivity, which is very exciting. Yeah. Even though uh, I don't think that the FWC is going to let them let them go, I, I think it's just a, a research project. Well, right now it's it's a research project, but but now that they've been able to do it because they worked hard 
you know, we've, we collect a lot of fish and they've had them up there and they've tried different, uh, enzyme, uh, not enzyme, different cocktails of, of chemicals and stuff to get them to spawn. Right. I want to go back to Hormones Bill. Hormones is what I'm thinking. I want to go right. back to Bill Curtis. Um, he was one to take ownership of spots, correct? Yep. He was one of the first ones. And there's, there's many, many guides that still take ownership of spots in Island Rod and the Keys. How, how do you feel about that? I'm totally against you being able to come and, and get the spot where I'm fishing because it's your spot. You weren't there. I pulled up, I started fishing, and now you're going to come and take. It's your spot. What makes it your spot? It's a spot, you know? So I I know a lot of my Keys buddies, you know, they think they worked hard and, and discovered a spot. Okay, so if they had a couple of years with it by themselves, it's not a secret. You know, you drive by, you see somebody in a spot, you think, oh, I think, you know, I know those fish that I was fishing in this place came from over there. Maybe I'll try there next time. Nobody's there. To me, it's first come, first serve. Now, things are changing. You know, there's more people fishing. There's, a, But I, I think it's crazy that, that somebody should be able to Fish over here, fish over here, fish over here, and then go to his honey hole. Because the tide's right. Because the tide's right. Yeah. And expect to get that spot. That's To me, that's bullshit. Yeah. Because my father and I in the last podcast talked a little bit about what we think is ethical and how we go about doing it, but that doesn't really matter because we're just do-it-yourselfers. <laughs> but to talk to someone like you, I just wanted to see your point of view. I know a lot of guides that are totally the other way where, you know, it's my spot, damn it. We're going to have a problem if you're in there. Some of my friends tell me that. <laughs> uh, so where do we go right? from here? To this day. Yeah, but they, they say, not really. You can fish over there if Tongue you want to. That there's China. one spot in, in Isla Mirada on the ocean side where I do a lot of bone fishing, or used to. Craig Key. Craig Key, yeah. We call it confrontation point now. <laughs> it got so bad that, that they won't let the tournament boats fish there because well you know what it is it's because a couple of guides have been grandfathered in to let's just call it what it is yeah. you know mikey ellers and yeah. john Donnell, and it is what it is yep and you know okay so those guys did develop the way to fish that spot back when i was going you know started to go down to alamrata 40 years ago it wasn't a stakeout spot it was a Place you, you started about halfway down the island, you you pulled this sort of all, all the way down, edge, and and then you know if if you saw some fish, maybe you turn back a little bit and get up, but get off of it, and you maybe make another pass, but it wasn't a stakeout spot. Kind of like it was loggerhead. Kind of, it was kind of Same a thing. It, it was kind of a you you were more instead of staked out, you were hovering. You know, you, you right. Kind that's, of that's interesting on the ocean when they're migratory fish coming at you. Yeah, because there's not. There's not too many spots like that today where you pull down yeah. the ocean. Well, the right. thing is, there are so many boats now, you can't do can't that do anymore. Because I, I would think like Long Key, you used to be able to get you know up by the point and kind of pull all the yep. way down. Yep. Uh, Sugarloaf in the lower keys, you could do that. Now there are people that are staked out on the ocean, but certain points are certain points as that is. But it's just not right to have somebody come in when the tide gets right and say, get the fuck out of here. Yeah, I, I think that's the, the worst thing about the present day the, the numbers yeah. and, and you know it's our fault it's the guide's fault that we For, let those guys do that that's what steve huff said meanwhile those guys both those guys are, are good friends of mine but uh we let it happen because when they started doing it there was a million places you could fish you didn't want to worry why about would you, why would you fight with somebody when you can just go over there yeah so you go on the bed you, you fish and you'd see if nobody was there you know maybe you'd stop there but you know when they pulled up you know, you'd get a tongue lashing. Right. right. Let's go to a funny place, if you don't mind. So Carl Hyacin, your great friend, very satirical, all the books he's written yeah. and the names of people that he's named, like his latest book, Squeeze Me, you know, <laughs> talking about pythons, you know, killing people in, in Palm Beach, which is so perfect and apropos. <laughs> he tells me a story when you built your boat after you had the aluminum, this big, heavy wooden boat and you guys were fishing flamingo and you had an issue with the other uh, cranking it up at the end of the day oh god that's not funny <laughs> <laughs> i 
<laughs> and he and I said, so with all these names that he's come up with in all of his books, right? You know the name he calls you? No. Captain Dildo? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> that, that was actually how did you not get, because of that. That, that, that was just reinforced it. That yeah. reinforced it. Right. Because my dad built a houseboat, and uh, we'd, we'd take it down there for a week at a time. And, and there's a <laughs> bank out in Florida Bay called Dildo Bank. We are going along. I, you know, I'd not really done that before, but I was, I had the map out and I was following the channel markers and everything. And I didn't know, you know, I didn't know there was any other way to get down there. I had to follow the channel markers. So this houseboat would, you know, it would go about 20 miles an hour. And we pulled this, this giant big old wooden skiff in back of it. And we're going along and it had, uh, just like, uh, six gallon gas tanks. It didn't have a built in tank. It had a, several of these six gallon gas tanks. And it was raining real hard one day. And, and people, I guess, thought I knew where I was going. So it was a <laughs> procession of boats in back of us. Following you. Following us. And I ran out of gas. So I had to stop. And, and Cat Dildo Bank was, was right, right on the map right there. So, you know, all these boats, now they have to go buy us. It's kind of a clusterfuck. And, <laughs> I'm trying to change the gas tank. Carlos, let's go, Captain Dildo. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that got started. But that that one in, when we're in Flamingo, I had I built this boat. It was shoestring, you know. I had no money, and I borrowed a, a trailer from the neighbor across the street who had a like a little ski boat, and it, you know it was crappy. So we just put it up on blocks, and I was using the trailer. It was all rusty and. And the winch didn't have a, a click on it. It was just, you know, you had to get it up if you let go or it, it backspin. Back right. So my boat was pretty heavy and the trailer was pretty shitty. So I was up over the top of it, like just getting it up. You know, yeah, Carl wasn't helping me crank it. <laughs> or pushing the boat. <laughs> and it slipped out of my hand and it whacked me right here. And, you know, I went blank for a while and then I saw stars. And, and, and you're laying there in the boat ramp. Yeah, bleeding. The so, boat slid off the trailer. I don't even know, you know, do I need reconstructive surgery? Because it, it hurt really bad. It, it wasn't bad. It just split my lip and didn't even knock out my teeth. It just, so, so then I had to drive all the way home like that. Bleeding, bleeding out. <laughs> well, he, we had a bag of ice and put the ice on there. <laughs> Yeah, I think, I think Carl was telling me that was that, a dildo that, move. That, 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 That's what yeah, we call this. Said, okay, <laughs> that's a dildo move. The um, what's the good news in this day? If we have any good news, you know, with all your efforts in Tallahassee and yeah, I went to Washington one time too, trying to get the sugar subsidies uh, amended so they don't have so much money. Still working on that, but I, you know, it, there's very little good news as far as I'm concerned. They've spawned bonefish. That's good news. Um, snook came back. Redfish came back. That's very good news. Lower Keys has more fish. Lower Keys has bonefish where they never had them before. Right. So to me, that's kind of, I don't know if that's a canary in the, in the mine shaft or what, but the fish did not used to live down there like they do now. They, maybe they have cleaner water. Maybe that's, that's what they're. That's what I'm saying. That's I think maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, because we do get pushes of them up here. Sometimes I'll see big schools of of you know two pound fish. I haven't seen them lately, but but you know sometimes on the inside down there by Caesars, you'll come across a giant mud. And you look down there, and there's several hundred small bone fish. Oh, that's cool. But but they don't do that, and and I I'm. I sure hope that it's our water's clean enough for them, and they they don't just hit the wall and go back to where they they came right. from. But isn't it true that they they lack big bonefish down there? Don't they have a lot of two to four pounds? Yeah, but I think that's because that they're new fish. They're not old. They're, enough. they're not old enough. There is a couple different species of bonefish, and yeah. and, uh, and it could be the what they call the gorians, gorianses or something. But uh, it's probably just because they're new 
Right. They're young. Mm -hmm. Well, also, too, BTT is doing such a great job because they've established state parks in the Bahamas mm -hmm. preventing people. It's a game fish, Belize. You know, they banned the netting in Cuba. So, in theory, we're getting a lot of the larva, bonefish larva yes. from Cuba up the Gulf Stream. Yes. So, I think if there's any good news, the science has proven and and the politics that BTT is trying to instill in all these countries that these fish are more valuable alive and being caught by sportsmen than being eaten. Yeah. And that goes way back to... Oh, for sure. BTT uh, has had a tremendous impact on, on the fishing. And, you know, I'm on the BOD of, of BTT. So, you know, maybe I'm a little biased, but a lot of the Keys guides had a problem with BTT because they were... BTT was studying the bonefish. They were going to find out where the bonefish were, and they're going to tell those rich people in, in Ocean, Ocean Reef, Reef, which is just not what was going on. So I was kind of a liaison originally. And the guides now know that, yeah, they need help. Bonefish need help. Right. But um, they would like more uh, positive... Um, feedback from that science yeah yeah they're, now they're saying one of the things i heard the other day you know the bonefish are coming back and btt hasn't done a thing for us well yeah well they're coming back because there's no more netting in in the cuba that's probably right. the main reason and also too let's just not look right here we have to look universally as to what these efforts yeah and the response of these efforts are doing so that's a good news. Yeah, that's very good news. And we get you on the board. <laughs> You're in Washington. And yeah. you've got a great voice. You've got a really big voice that, that everybody respects so much, Bob. That's nice of you to say that. I I am uh, discouraged by the possibility of Biscayne Bay being polluted beyond bonefish tolerances. I just had some, uh, I did some work with some scientists taking water samples down by Turkey Point. And, you know, their cooling canals are, are meant to be uh, um, a closed system, but they aren't, you know, it's limestone and it's leaking through. And uh, that could be why, why things are so bad. Uh, who knows? That but, might be the single most devastating uh, issue yeah because the the fish come up from this from the south and they go down the shoreline it, it, it's right there yeah when they if they come at a time when there's a lot of runoff and and the water's really bad it they're not going them. through that right they're gonna make a u-turn yeah they're gonna go someplace else maybe they go out by la key because the water's clean Deeper out there water. But, but yeah so you it, know, it was, doesn't seem like that's happened it does it seems like the fish are still in decline in the bay Whereas in the lower keys, they're coming definitely back. coming back. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being such a great pal all, all these years. And you years. know what? It's been a pleasure. Big time. It's been a pleasure. You are a huge, a huge legend and so <laughs> well respected. And I want you to know how, how everybody feels about you when I speak about Bob Branham. <sighs> they love you. That's so nice to say. I'm going to get misty. Well, rightfully so. Thanks, bro. Thanks, man. We've had a good run, man. Thanks, Bob. I love fishing with you. Nikki, I, I just remembered it. I was going to say, I think I caught my first saltwater fish with Bob. And Do you I, remember I shark never... fishing one day? With yes. Me? I think that was my first fish ever. <laughs> I remember your mom getting pissed because for some reason, you were filming uh, just with a handheld. A little handheld video camera. Video camera. And so we got this black tip into the boat. Up, up on the front. Oh, deck. right. And, we still have that photo somewhere right and, here. And you said, Nikki, come here and get in the picture. And Nikki was, he was just a little guy. Right. And that shark swatted his tail. <laughs> I remember. I went back, I went back to the back motor. From, yeah. yeah. Hit him right in the head, I think. Oh, God. It was like, oh, my God. Why did, we, why did I do that? Why? Well, That's why you... I don't take him out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he had a gap in his lip and you had a good hold of him. No, that was a great story, and I think that was my first fish ever. So was it really? Yeah, wow. that, there we go. Circle. So here we go. So I, I, I made caught, you too. I yeah. caught. We caught our three first fish. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yeah. Thank hey, you. Hey, this so is much. fun. This is fun. Big time fun. We will have to get together again sometime. For sure.
You too, Nick. Let's go fishing. I love yeah, that. Yeah, that would be refreshing in these uh, trying times. When I saw his West Side Story.